in Grinnell. I serve a congregation there across from Grinnell College. And I think it was right around the, um, uh, the massacre in Las Vegas. Uh, it sort of dawned on everybody that we had the president of the NRA living in our town, um, literally crossing his paths at uh, going to the movies or the little grocery store. And um, someone I thought very reasonably asked me, has anyone ever spoken with him about gun safety? And I thought, I don't know, I'll try. So I, I called uh, his offices and left a message. And you know, I, I could see where he might perceive this if he hadn't met me as something maybe confrontational. But really, I wanted to allow that there's a possibility that those who are really involved in, in gun making and selling and things like that, maybe there are things about gun safety they know that, that I don't, and perhaps we could work together. And uh, he didn't answer. Um, and then I guess we let a couple weeks go by and myself and another pastor wrote him a letter this time a bit more formally saying we would love to meet with you at your convenience. Uh, this is really so that we can learn about you. How can, how can you and, and, and we work together to increase gun safety? And again, there was no response whatsoever. And that led to um, a letter from the citizens, 170 people in town wrote in, said, please would you meet with us? We're your neighbors. Uh, we know you, we see you at the movies, we sit next to you in restaurants, would you talk with us? And there was no answer, he didn't reply. Um, I think, you know, I've learned since then that's sort of the modus operandi of the NRA. We started doing, we called them actions, and it was 26 days of actions to commemorate the 26 people who were killed in Newtown. And these were all things that you could do that were beyond thoughts and prayers. They were actual things like writing your legislator, um, showing up at, um, at uh, a lawmaker's office and asking questions. Um, we had a number of documentaries about gun safety um, and, and pretty good ones. And it culminated with a visit from uh, people who had actually been in Newtown, including David Wheeler, whose son Ben was killed at Sandy Hook School. And we had a screening of a, of a documentary about Newtown. I think about 400 people from town showed up. All told, easily a few thousand people were involved in the, the actions that we had. And then the last one was uh, a three mile funeral procession from downtown Grinnell to um, the Brown uh, facility uh, right on I 80. Many of you have probably seen it. And we had a silent vigil there. We didn't have any signs. It wasn't a protest. It was literally a funeral march. Uh, we all learned a lot about that. None of us were professional activists, and we didn't have a, we actually didn't even have a committee coordinating any of these things. We had a little group of people we'd get together and come up with ideas. And, and there were certain things that were really interesting to us, like learning that um, Brownell sold more AR-15s in the three days after Newtown than they had in the three previous years. Mm, right? I started thinking about extremes because, um, you know, rural Iowa, people hunt and that's great. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota and hunting and fishing is part of uh, the life there, especially in northern Minnesota. And so it's, it's the extremes that really came to be highlighted for me. Extremes like you can give away an AR-15 as a door prize. Extremes like you have to uh, pass uh, certain exams to get a license to have a little Ruger that's about this big but you can take your AR-15 home today. Extremes like this proposed amendment to the Iowa Constitution. The Episcopal Diocese of Iowa, we are registered in opposition to it because it's an extreme. It expresses a fundamental fear that people have that they're not being protected. And that induces, I hope, some compassion in those of us who care about gun safety. What is the motivating factor behind these extremes, between, behind giving away AR-15s, behind proposing uh, a proposed constitutional amendment that would effectively uh, end the ability for us to enact any gun safety legislation like for a long time? This, I think, is the most important thing um, for Iowans who care about gun safety to pay attention to right now, uh, the proposed constitutional amendment. And we don't have to pose this uh, to our lawmakers as an all or nothing. Uh, the, the boy, you know, great idea to let's have a, a mirror of the Second Amendment attached to the Iowa Constitution. That's fine. Uh, strict scrutiny, as was already said, is particularly dangerous. It means that any kind of challenge to anything has to err in favor of the, of the constitutional right. So um, I would say that some compassion uh, for the fear that is um, in those who are proposing uh, 
this plethora of gun legislation. Uh, I don't want to assume um, negativity on their part or, or specious uh, motives on their part. I want to assume they're afraid. And how can I let that understanding and the compassion that might come up out of that help me as I try to advocate for a more sensible approach to gun safety? We don't have to be one or the other. As many of you, I'm sure, already know, we can support hunting, we can support people who are sport shooters, we can support the Second Amendment, um, and it's just not true that that means uh, that every gun is okay everywhere all the time, and so is any kind of alteration to it. We have to, we have to allow for the ability to be nuanced in gun legislation, and the proposed um, amendment to the Iowa Constitution just negates the possibility for nuance at all.